All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles. If you have a Bible at hand there, look to chapter 11 of Acts, please. We're continuing our study uh, through the book of Acts. I'm going to just read a short portion this morning from verse 19 of Acts chapter 11 down to verse 26. Acts chapter 11, verse 19, down to verse 26. And the title this morning's message is going to be a very simple one, Encouragement from Jerusalem. Encouragement from Jerusalem. So verse 19, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exalted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. Then Barnabas, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us. Now, this chapter is a contrast chapter because in the first half of the chapter, we, we had men coming from Jerusalem when they heard that the gospel had gone to Cornelius' household. And remember that these men didn't come to encourage, they came to criticize. They basically said, you, Peter, have been with uncircumcised men and you've eaten with them. And so they, they came and they had a critical spirit and they were there judging Peter and he had to defend his actions. But things have changed. And now the Jerusalem church get to hear, not just of Cornelius' household, but a great many of Gentiles, the Grecians, turning to the Lord. And when they hear about it, they, they send, instead of the circumcision party, I noticed that they didn't send them, they sent Barnabas instead. And he came along. But why did they pick that guy? Well, because his nickname, his real name is Joseph. But his nickname is Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And so they said, we're going to pick the most encouraging brother we can send to go there and minister to those saints. And so it's a, it's a wonderful contrast. It tells us the church is learning lessons. They're getting a message. They're, they're responding to the Holy Spirit as things are being revealed to them. It's a wonderful thing. Remember, that there's this development uh, in the book of Acts of the church beginning in Acts chapter 2, and slowly but surely, there's massive changes taking place. We said that part of the, the way to look at Acts is the trauma of transition, the difficulty of change. Change is never easy, and this change is taking place in stages, and the first stage, of course, was the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and the baptizing of those 120 people into one body in that upper room, and that was the beginning. And then, of course, another big change was the gospel coming for the first time to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And Cornelius and his household getting saved, believing the gospel, and being changed. Another significant change that we want to focus our attention on today is that in the Old Testament, when the Jews came into the land of Israel, they were told specifically that there was only one legitimate place where they could meet with God. 
that one place. That one place was the temple in Jerusalem. If you remember tabernacle before and after that, the temple. And let's just highlight that for us just to see this. <clears throat> this was the way it was in the Old Testament. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. Now this, uh, I remember years ago, uh, we were doing a series on the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, I was assigned the section from Deuteronomy chapter 12. So I remember this very, very well. And uh, one of the, the, the key ideas in this section is the place where God chose to put his name there. And so he says, for instance, in verse 5, uh, it says, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and thither thou shalt come. So they were only allowed to come to that one place where he'd chosen to place his name. It says in verse 10, but when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows, which you vow unto the Lord. And as you go through that chapter, it, it emphasizes this one place over and over again, the place where he has chosen to place his name. And initially it was in Shiloh where the tabernacle was established. Then it moved from Shiloh and ended up finally in Jerusalem. And that's where the one place was. But the Lord Jesus had already told us that that was going to change. A massive change was going to take place in God's dealings with men. You might say God's dispensational, and I'm not trying to pinch uh, the, the uh, message from Shannon here, but God's dispensational changes were occurring. And if you look at John 4 and verse 21, he says to this woman of Samaria, Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And so this, this place is going to change. And, and we're going to see here in Acts that we're, we're going to see a massive change. Jerusalem is the center of everything right now, in a sense. Even when they hear about people in Antioch getting saved, they're going to send people there like Barnabas to check on things, make sure everything's okay. Jerusalem's headquarters, that's going to change. In fact, Antioch is going to be the headquarters. But from Antioch, the gospel is going to go all over the, 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 the then known world. It's going to go to the very uh, center of the empire, to Rome, all across uh, the, the Roman empire. And the simple thought is that what the Lord Jesus said is, yeah, there's only uh, now, instead of just this mountain, Actually, the one place where people are going to gather is to his name. Remember Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, whether that's in Springfield, Missouri, or next week I'll be in Jersey City in New Jersey, and I'll be there at the one place again where his name is. And the week after, I'm going to be in Minnesota, and guess what? I'll be at that one place again. But it's not in one geographical location. It's wherever wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, that's where he, his presence is guaranteed. And so a massive change is taking place. And of course, that old place, Jerusalem and the temple, which was so central to worship, well, it's not going to be too long. In AD 70, as the Lord said, not one stone of this building is going to be left upon another. And he's going to say, I'm, this is change. I'm bringing a big change here. Massive change. And now it's wherever people meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we're going to see these things occur in this chapter. So verse 19, he says, Now they which were scattered abroad on, upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. I want you to notice that in this little section too, what uh, Luke is doing is tying some threads together. So we're going we're gonna to tie it back to things that have 
have been mentioned before. So this, they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Well, that takes us back to chapter six and chapter seven, doesn't it, with Stephen? I remember his sermon and his, uh, his character and then his stoning. And then chapter eight and verse one, it says, and Saul was consenting to his death. And at, th at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. This is at the stoning of Stephen. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So that group that was scattered abroad, it says they were in Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Well, now it's going to say they didn't stop at Judea and Samaria. In fact, it says they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. In other words, they kept on going, right? So they're scattered because of the persecution of Stephen, they start in Judea, they go to Samaria, they go to Phoenice, they go uh, from there uh, further to Cyprus, then they go to Antioch. So they're moving further and further away from Jerusalem and preaching the gospel as they go. And remember, it, it wasn't the apostles. It's just the ordinary saints, those that were scattered abroad, the apostles, right, the big guns, the big guns stayed in Jerusalem. The ones that went were just the ordinary Christians, but when they went, everywhere they went, they preached the word. Isn't that wonderful? So we, we can't think that this preaching about Jesus is just in the hands of the experts. Because if it was just left to the experts, hardly anybody would get saved, right? It's every Christian's responsibility, as we're scattered abroad, to tell people about the Lord Jesus. And so it says they did this, and it says they were preaching the word, but, but they were very selective in who they were preaching to, to none but the Jews only. So they just went to the Jews. They, they, I guess the message of Cornelius' household hadn't dawned on them fully yet. So they're still kind of restricting their preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, preaching that message, but they're preaching it to none but the Jews only. Now, I just want to say a few things about Antioch before we go any further, because it tells us Venice, Cyprus, and Antioch. And uh, six times Antioch is mentioned in these uh, few verses that I read to you this morning. So clearly Antioch is, is the focus of our attention in this. So where was Antioch? Well, if you were to look on a map today, it's in Turkey. Amazing how much of the New Testament took place in Turkey. A quite significant amount of churches were established in Turkey, and, and, and Antioch was in Turkey. And so there it is. It, it was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire. Of course, Rome was the biggest. And then the next biggest city was Alexandria, which is in Egypt. And the third biggest city was Antioch, which is in as in day Turkey. Uh, in those days, it was in Syria. It was called part of what was called Syria. In fact, it was the headquarters of a special military regiment called Rome's Syrian Regiment. They had a big regiment that was stationed there. And it was also, you know, a lot of these cities were connected to certain deities. Uh, we, we think of uh, Ephesus, we say, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, we think of Antioch. We think of Daphne. That's an old name. You don't, it, not many babies are called Daphne anymore, are they? But Daphne, and she was a goddess. And again, like many of these, uh, lots of immorality. They were usually connected with fertility. And Daphne was no different. And so it, they, they said that it was the second most immoral city in the Roman Empire after Corinth was Antioch. So this is a place where th there's a lot of Gentiles there. They're very wicked. They're caught up with the worship of Daphne and great immorality. It was a few miles inland from the port city of Seleucia. And so uh, this is where they end up and they're preaching uh, the message, but preaching the word, but to none but the Jews only. Now it says in verse 20, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Grecians. So we might say this, that if, if Peter opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, these guys burst the doors wide open 
I mean, they, these men from, I mean, they really got it. They understood that God's grace was moving out from Jerusalem uh, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so they preached to the Grecians. And so they're preaching to the Grecians, men, and, and praise God for these men. This is a courageous thing to do. And they're preaching the gospel uh, in Antioch to the Grecians, and they're preaching one simple message, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that a great message? That's what they preached. They didn't preach politics. Uh, they didn't preach self-improvement. Uh, they didn't preach uh, a kind of opinions of men. They preached the Lord Jesus. That was their message. And they delighted to preach that message concerning the Lord Jesus, the Lord from heaven, who was born in Bethlehem's manger, who went to Calvary to redeem lost humanity by dying as the substitute on that center cross. That is the message that they preached. And it tells us that as they preached that message, verse 21, it says the hand of the Lord was with them. Isn't that a beautiful statement? It's, it's actually used very frequently in the Old Testament. Men like Ezekiel talks about the hand of the Lord was upon him. But it's very rare in the New Testament. In fact, Luke is the only one who uses that phrase, the hand of the Lord was upon him. But he uses it quite a bit. But nobody else does. And what do we mean by the hand of the Lord was upon him? The, idea is the hand of God signals uh, God's invisible power being revealed and so in the old testament it talks about his mighty right arm being made bare and what it's saying is that the invisible god is making himself seen in divine power his arm is out right and he's and it's of course his right arm is the idea of his strength and so the idea of the hand of the lord being upon someone is that god's invisible power is being manifest through that person and so these individuals, as they're preaching the Lord Jesus, the hand of the Lord was upon them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it could be said that the hand of the Lord was upon our ministry? That his power was being, being mediated through these weak vessels, but was, was being demonstrated. God showing his power through these individuals. And may God help us that, that his power might be seen through the preaching of the Lord Jesus, through these individuals, through our lives too. And they came at a good time because the Gentile world was worn out and wearied with their pagan superstitions. They were heartsick over the deadness of their gods. You know, these gods, are, they're lifeless. They can't do anything for them. And, and, and the debauchery that went with it. And, and what we read is that there was this sense amongst the heathen world that things were not well. And they were ready for a message of hope. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to a brother this week. Uh, he's been involved in going to the fair in his community for the last 10 years. Every year, he set up a, a, a table at the fair. And he said, he said to me, he said, Mike, you're not going to believe this, but this year has been unreal. He said, the number of people who have come to us and they're telling us something's not right. And they're wide open. See, it's interesting how God sometimes prepares. And, and you know, th this, this America that we remember, it's kind of crumbling at the seams, isn't it? Maybe this is an opportunity for the hand of the Lord to be made known again in the preaching of the gospel. Because people know there's something not right with good old America right now. And with the world, not just here, it's everywhere. There, there's a crisis in our world right now. Things are falling apart. Everybody can see. Even the peanut butter aisle was diminished greatly yesterday. This is getting worrying. You know, you go to a supermarket. I'm used to shelves being filled. Like, this is not the Soviet Union. Tissues. You want to buy kind of tissues that don't have all that poo-poo stuff in it, whatever it is, you know, the kind of lotions and stuff, regular tissues. You can't find them anywhere. What's going on? See, everything's changing. Can't get what it used to be again. You see how it's... And so people are realizing this. I mean, the average person recognizes something's not right. This is a glorious opportunity for us to speak to men and women about this. Well, let's not miss it. These worn out Gentiles, they were ready for this kind of message. And it says, the hand of the Lord was with them. And notice it says, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? 
In, in fact, he emphasizes it again in verse 24, that this man, he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. This is a time of harvest, a time of great in gathering. People are getting saved, not individually, but in flocks, it seems. Like people, just whole groups are getting saved. Tremendous time. And so it tells us, verse 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And I want to just stop there. It's very obvious that the church in New Testament language is not a building. <coughs> because you don't see many buildings with ears. I suppose you could say that, you know, those in antennae that they used to have, you know, to get a satellite look a bit, but they're not really ears, right? And so that's, one brother did a series of messages on the church, and he says, the church is a people, not a steeple. That was the title of one of his messages. It's not a building. This where we meet is for our convenience, but it's not the church. It's where the church meets. We're the church. The church is made of living stones, right? We're a spiritual house. Uh, and so uh, it's clear from the New Testament. And, and so we, we talk about, oh, you turn left at the church on the corner. Because in our culture, what became the people has now become associated with the building. And yet for the first two centuries, the, the church didn't meet in designated buildings. Yeah, they, they met in homes. Uh, sometimes in various other places, but uh, in, in the school of Tyrannus, but they didn't meet in designated, as it were, consecrated buildings for the first couple of centuries. And so we need to just get that clear in our minds. What is the church? It's not a building. It's a people. It's a redeemed people that have believed in the Lord Jesus as their savior. And they've been put into this spiritual house and that is what the church is. So, so tidings came to the church, which is in Jerusalem. And it says, they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. And we've already alluded to this, but can you imagine what would have happened if they had sent the circumcision party instead of Barnabas? I think he might have put them under some legalistic, they might have put them under some legalistic constraints, right? Well, you need to get circumcised, you know, you need to keep the law, you need to keep, you know, and, and there would have been all this, and this, this issue, by the way, is going to develop, we get to chapter 15, it's going to become a big live issue. Can somebody be saved without being circumcised? Massive issue. Thank God that he, they didn't send the circumcision part, because the history of the church may have been very different. Instead, they thought, who could we send? Who, who might be an encourager to these dear new believers? And they said, well, there's only one guy that stands out. This guy, Barnabas. Yeah, he, he already had encouraged everybody by selling a piece of land and giving it all and laying it at the apostles' feet. Remember that. And then when nobody would have anything to do with this new convert called Saul of Tarsus because they thought he might be a spy or he may, you know, he may not be genuine, it says that he went and he, he, he acted as his letter of commendation. Remember, we've, see, we've seen that. In the, so this guy, he's just got a track record of being an encouraging brother. But isn't that wonderful? To be around people who are encouraging brothers or sisters. It's not restricted to gender, the ability to encourage. And so we might ask ourselves, would anybody ever send us on a mission? <laughs> because we have the reputation of being just really encouraging. We hear of some new work somewhere. Who would you send? Is there somebody that you could say, I'm going to send this brother. He's going to really help. Him. He's going to really encourage them. And so they picked this man, and he went, and he began to observe things. Notice what it says. It says, verse 23, who, when he came, says he had seen the grace of God. A wonderful little statement. He had seen the grace of God. The first thing he does is he looks to see what is God doing. 
What's God doing here? I remember years ago, uh, there was an assembly and, and a number of people said, oh, you don't want to go speak at that assembly. It, it, you know, they're, they're just, they're not a good place. Well, I don't like going by other people's rep, you know, recommendation. I'd like to check it out myself because sometimes I've been told a place is a bad place and gone there, found out it was a wonderful place. So I went to this assembly and uh, uh, the prayer meeting before the ministry was given, I don't think I've ever been in one quite like it. It was absolutely marvelous. And I thought, boy, I'm glad I didn't listen to everybody's advice. I'm glad I went. This was a dynamic place and it was a wonderful experience. And so, so he, he looked for, what is God doing here? And, and it says he saw the grace of God. Now that's a, a difficult thing, isn't it? How do you see the grace of God? What do we mean by the grace of God? Well, we know that the grace of God is God's unmerited, undeserved favor. That's the idea of grace, isn't it? Unmerited, undeserved. And so how did he see the grace of God? Well, he saw, he saw Gentiles who once were worshiping Daphne and once were involved in gross immorality and their lives had been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even their very countenances showed a different story. They were new creatures and he witnessed the grace of God. Isn't it wonderful to see a new life in Christ, to see somebody change, to see that transformation? Even their very countenance from a scowl, and a frown uh, to, to just the joy of the Lord. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see the transformation that the gospel brings. And he said he saw the grace of God. He, he, he witnessed it. And it says he saw the grace of God and he was glad. What makes you glad? What gladdens your heart? I'll tell you, there's nothing more thrilling and seeing somebody saved. Amen. To see a soul pass from death to life, to see someone become a new creature, that's a, that's a thrill. And it says he was glad. Oh, he was so glad. He's glad at seeing the grace of God. And it says he exalted them all. You see, he's an exalter or an encourager. And so, so he's exalting them. And what's he exalting them to do? To cleave unto the Lord. That's a, that's a great a piece of advice for all of us, right? To cleave to the Lord is to stay close to him. Don't, don't drift from the Lord. You, you just hold on close to the Lord. Now, he's holding on to you, so don't worry if you, if you drift a little bit because he's, he's got you in his hand and the Father's got you in his hand and you're not going to get too far. But nevertheless, he says, he, he encourages him, you stay close to the Lord. That's great advice, isn't it? You keep in close communion with the Lord. You, you walk in fellowship with him. You, you, don't, you don't let anything come between you and the Lord. You just stay in that intimate communion. You cleave to the Lord. Well, how we need to cleave to the Lord in these days, don't we? So much that would distract us, so much that would distress us. Oh, we need to cleave, hold on tight to the Lord in these difficult times. And so he encourages them to do that. With purpose of heart, they will cleave to the Lord. And then it gives us a little description. And it's a lovely description. He was a good man. Kind of an interesting thing to study in the word of God every time the phrase good man is used. Not used a lot. 13 times I came up with this morning. But not a lot. Because there's a lot of bad men. But good man. What is a good man? Let me just read a couple of them that I came up with. Uh, that stood out to me in my looking at them uh, but <clears throat> there's many more but uh, th these two just really stood out psalm 37 verse 23 the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord and he delighteth in his word certainly we could say that about barnabas his steps were ordered by the lord <laughs> and and uh, he 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 did he certainly delighted in his way and so that's a good description of barnabas uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, it says, <clears throat> it's Matthew 13, that's why it looks really strange, verse, yeah, verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, 
and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So a good man <coughs> out of the good treasure of his heart will bring forth good things. Be, but the good things will come out of his mouth, right? That's the idea that, that, that it, it'll, it'll be goodness will be seen in his life, like the Lord Jesus. See, Barnabas was like his master. His master went about doing good. And even when he spoke, uh, the words that came, people said, never speak, a man spake like, like this man, because it was out of a heart of goodness. And so Barnabas was a reflection of his master. He was a good man. And it says he was full of the Holy Ghost. Brethren, sisters, we have to have spirit-filled Christianity. We want to be New Testament believers. Can't do it in the flesh. Let me tell you, New Testament Christianity does not work if the people who are conducting themselves in this manner do it in the energy of the flesh. It's a disaster. We have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And the problem is sometimes we're so filled with other things, filled with self, filled with cares, filled with rage. What's filling you? You often sing, empty that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand. Oh, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And not only is he full of the Holy Spirit, he's full of faith. He's, he's a man who believed God believed his word, had expectations because he believed the promises of God. And without faith, we're at nothing, right? We, we, we need faith. We have to believe God, believe his word. And Barnabas says that all of these things characterized him. How would somebody describe you? Good to ask yourself the question. If they, somebody would say, describe you, how, what? If they're just to do it in a few short phrases, what would they say? Wouldn't you love it if you heard back that somebody had said about you that you were a good man or a good woman, that you were full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith? Would, would that light your fire a little bit if you heard that? It, you'd probably get proud. You need to humble yourself. But, <laughs> but, but it's, it's amazing, isn't it? What a wonderful thing to, to have, have said about somebody. And notice it says this. And much people was added unto the Lord. They sent the right man, didn't they? See, he doesn't hinder the work. Already there's blessing. And when he sent, blessing continues. He you don't pour cold water on it. The Lord uses him and the work continues to be blessed. And much people was added to the Lord. And then he does something quite remarkable in verse 25. And again, it's pulling back one of these loose threads. You see... We hadn't heard much about Stephen and those that were scattered for a while. Then we hadn't heard much about Barnabas for a while, and he reintroduced Barnabas. And now there's a third person he wants to bring back to our remembrance, this man called Saul of Tarsus. Notice it says, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. So he's bringing Saul of Tarsus back into the equation. The last time we saw this guy, he was being let down a city wall in a basket. <laughs> if you remember, what a good ending. Like we didn't see much of him. And, and we knew that after that, he went to Jerusalem and then, and then he was in trouble there. And then, and then uh, he kind of disappeared off the map and he hadn't been seen for about 10 years. No, we haven't gone that many pages, but 10 years have elapsed since we last saw Saul of Tarsus. And it tells us that Barnabas went to get him. And it says that he went to seek Saul. And that word seek, it's kind of an intense word. It, it, it means that there's an intensity to it. Uh, it. It means it was a frantic search. And, and the, the line, how we know that is how you, Luke uses it elsewhere. He uses it in Luke chapter 2 and verse 45. And that was, if you remember, uh, when the Lord Jesus had gone missing from his family. And, and it says, and, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now, could you, it would be a frantic search if you just lost your son in the, in the crowds of Jerusalem uh, at a festival, and you've gone a whole day, and then you suddenly realize, where is he? And we've got to find him. And so they go on this frantic search. Because we've got to find it. And that's the language that 
is used here. This is a, this is a frantic search to find Saul. Why, why is it such a difficulty, this search? I mean, he's in, he went to Tarsus to seek Saul. I mean, why didn't he just go to the family home? Isn't that where you find him? Well, no. Just remember that in Philippians, Paul said that he had counted all things lost for the excellency of known Christ. I wonder what that loss entailed. I mean, how do you think his family, who proudly raised this Pharisee, this, this student of Gamaliel, uh, this man who is clearly marked for leadership in Judaism, and he throws it all away following this false messiah in their mind. I suspect that part of what price this man paid was rejection, maybe even disinheritance. So that's the kind of thing that happened in those days. I suffered the loss of all things. And so, even if they go asking, well, where's Saul? Nobody would want to cooperate with these Christians. And so he had to make a diligent search to find this guy. He obviously has got a big reason why he wants to find him, that he's going to do that. And it tells us a lot about Barnabas, doesn't it? Because I think it tells us this, that Barnabas realized when he saw the need in Antioch, he could encourage them and he could take them so far but he needed somebody else's gift that he didn't have to take them further. And that's a, that's a big deal, isn't it? Because it's going to have a big effect on Barnabas's life. Because in the, initially, we're going to see Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. But it's going to change. It's going to be Paul and Barnabas. And all of a sudden, Barnabas who's this great encouraging brother is going to be the second fiddle in the orchestra, right? He's not going to be the, the leading brother anymore. He's going to have to, as it were, take a lower place and let somebody else who could be more helpful take the leading place. And that takes great humility to know when it's time to step down and let somebody else take the lead. We don't like that. I mean, I've held the reins here for a long time. I don't want to do that. But sometimes we've got to do it because somebody else can take it forward. And so, and, and it's, it's good. There's one assembly that I, I speak in, and I really like going there. One of the reasons I like going there is that the, the elders there are very exercised about ministry that the assembly needs. And, and not only the exercise about ministry that they need, who's the best person to to give them that ministry. And if they don't feel they as elders can do it, they will specifically go and get someone else and say, would you come and minister to these saints on this topic? I like that. I think that's the spirit that we see here, right? In other words, I, I can't take him any further, but I know somebody who can. I'm going to go get him. And yeah, I'm willing to take a sideline place and let him take the place. That's, that's, I think that's tremendous wisdom. And tremendous humility on the part of Barnabas. It's, it's self-depreciating. Such a foreign thing in our culture, right? To self-depreciate when we live in a culture where it's all about self-assertiveness. But he's willing to take a lower place because he thinks this brother can be more. And what's he thinking about? He's thinking about the saints. What's best for the saints. As we move forward as an assembly, let me tell you, it's not what's best for you or what's best for me. It, it's what's best for the saints and what's best for the Lord that should be in the back of our minds. What's the best thing for them, for the Lord and what's best for them for the saints? And so <clears throat> it tells us that he gets Saul and it tells us, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, again, let me just suggest another thing. I wonder if Barnabas remembered hearing Paul's testimony. I'm pretty sure that he, he did. If he's going to uh, bring him to the assembly in Jerusalem and act as his letter of commendation, at the very least, he should have asked, tell me how you got saved, right? And in his testimony, 
If you remember, one of the things it says in verse 15, the Lord said to him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's 15 and 16 there in Acts 9. Now, let me just say this, that I think Barnabas remembered that little statement He's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles. And here in Antioch, guess what we've just seen happen? A whole bunch of Gentiles just got saved. And immediately the penny drops and Barnabas thinks, oh, I remember hearing about Saul. That was what God called him for, to, to bear his name before the Gentiles. I'm going to go get him. I'm going to find he's going to be a tremendous help to these men. And of course, Paul would cut his teeth in ministering to Gentiles, which would mark the rest of his life. And so I want to suggest to you that this verse, where it says that he went to find Saul, was a historic moment. Our world was changed because he went to get Saul of Tarsus. Because when we think of New Testament Christianity today, who do we owe such a debt to? Saul of Tarsus, right? We owe so much to him. Where would we be without Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Hebrews? You gotta throw that in there too. All writings from this masterly man, right? What a blessing. We've been so blessed by this man. And Barnabas said, I'll go get it. So thankfully did. And so it says, when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So they taught much people for a whole year. And this teaching clearly had an impact on them. These former pagans now were so utterly changed that they, they got a nickname, Christ Ones. In other words, the word of God had changed them from Daphne-worshipping pagans to people who resemble Jesus Christ. And everybody said, oh, they're Christians. They're Christ Ones. First time it was ever used. It wouldn't be used officially for two centuries. It was always used in, in derision, a nickname will be adopted two centuries down the pike, but initially. <clears throat> so I want to just point quickly, our time is just about gone. I want to point out three things that are interesting here. Verse 20, it all begins with preaching the Lord Jesus. That's gospel preaching. And then when Barnabas comes, there's exaltation. So we've got gospel preaching. We've got a word of exaltation. We need that too. And then the third thing we've got is teaching. We need all three. We need the ministry of gospel preaching. We need the ministry of exaltation, coming alongside, stirring up, encouraging. And we need the ministry of teaching. And all three of them are involved here in Antioch. And then the disciples were first called Christians. Of course, it's, it's pretty radical now because in those days, Christians... <laughs> The term Christian was used to distinguish them from Jews and Gentiles. First Corinthians 10, verse 32, there's only three groups, the Jew, the Gentile, the church of God. In our culture, it's, it's come to, well, it's, it's lost some of its meaning. There was a time when if a person was born in America, they'd say, well, he's a Christian. But he may not resemble Christ at all. In fact, he may be more like the devil in his behavior than the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it's just become a nominal thing. So what is a Christian? Somebody who does resemble Jesus Christ. But you see, we can't resemble Jesus Christ in our own sinful state because the flesh will never, ever replicate what the Lord Jesus is like. That's why we need to be born from above. We need a new birth from heaven that allows the Spirit of God to come into us and manifest Christ-like through us. 
And so you cannot be a real Christian unless you've been born again. How do you get to be born again? For the Lord Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Suspended on a cross between heaven and earth, that whosoever believeth on him, realize there, they've been bit by the serpent of sin. They're ready to perish. But Jesus bore our sin in his own body on that tree. And that person believes on him, puts their trust for eternity, not in themselves, not in their good works, not on their, their family lineage or background, but they trust in the finished work of Christ as their only hope for eternity. They trust in Jesus Christ. It says that person will never perish but have everlasting life. But not only that, he'll become a new creature. He'll get a new nature, a new life work flowing through his veins, the life of Christ as the Spirit of God takes up residence in him. And he begins to change from what he was more and more to be like Christ. So that when people see, they say, oh, there's a Christ one. Is that what they see when they see us? Is there enough evidence in our lives to convict us of being a Christian? Or do we just look like nice people? Oh, that guy's not, you know, he's, he's a nice guy. He's not a rowdy neighbor. He's pleasant. Or is there enough Christ-likeness in us that makes people think of the Lord Jesus? Well, a great work is about to begin in Antioch. It's going to become the center of world missions. From there, the gospel is going to go to the very ends of the earth. But this is how it all began. It began by the church hearing about what God had done through the courage of these from Cyprus and Cyrene. They, 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 as it were, taken Peter opening the door. They had burst the gates open and gone and preached Christ to the Gentiles. Then they sent on. Such an encouraging brother. And then he got Paul and brought him. And then they taught the word. And then this, these people, are they're so changed. Are we being changed by the word? We have lots of teaching. But is it changing us? Is it transforming us? Are we different? These were different. They were changed by the word of God. They weren't just informed. They were transformed. Amen. Oh, may God transform us. So we're more like the Lord Jesus, less like our old rotten selves. And that's what the world needs. It needs to see little, little imitations, little people who remind them of Christ here and there as they interact with them and they see a difference. And they might even ask, what is it with you? See, we're supposed to give an answer for the hope that's within us. The assumption is somebody's going to ask us. Is there enough of Christ in me for somebody to ask, what is it about me? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the practicality of the word of God. Father, we thank you for Barnabas, and we pray for more Barnabases today. Oh, Lord, how we need encouragers. How we need men like this that are good men and good women. Lord, we need good men and good women. We need people who are full of the Holy Spirit. We need people who are full of faith. And we need people who live fruitful lives so that when we see them, we're caused to think about the Lord Jesus. Forgive us, Father, if at any point our conduct has been so unbecoming that we have not caused people to think about the Lord Jesus or even think negatively about the Lord Jesus. If that man is a Christian, I don't want to be one. Oh, Lord, help us to realize we're really being watched. And so transform us by thy spirit and make us bright testimonies. And if there's one here that thinks they're Christians, but they've never experienced that new life from above, never been born again by the spirit of God, that you would speak to them about their, the fact that they're imposters. They're claiming to be something they're not. And they need to be saved. They need to trust in the finished work of Christ. Speak to their hearts, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.